Well, I hope you're doing great. I want to highlight a couple things from the scripture this week, and it has a real effect sometimes to see in the Bible the way things are presented. We present things sometimes one way, the Bible presents it another way. The Bible's way usually is a reflection of a truth that's important to see. This is true in so many things in life. I don't want to load you down with too many. I'm going to pick one tonight, and it's about uh, a phrase. We might say a phrase like this, I'm working for God. We often will say, I'm doing this because I'm working for God. I'm doing this job. I'm doing this ministry. I'm doing this. I'm working for God. When people say that, it doesn't always mean that they think this, but sometimes it's like, well, I come up with something I'm going to do. I come up with it, and then I do it for God. A very different thing to say, I'm working with God. Now, in the Bible, you would see not, not situations of people working for God. You would see mostly people working with God. Very important to see this. The Bible characters that you know my name, uh, so to speak, uh, you know me, I'm not a Bible character, but if there's some that you know by name or you know my name, my name is Paul, you know Paul or Peter or Enoch or Abraham or Isaac, Jacob, all these people, Noah, uh, Moses, you will see people that are working with God. That's a very different thing. I want to give you an example of this in a very specific, not a broad example, but a highly specific example where this exactly comes true. It's a guy by the name of Ezekiel. He is a prophet. There was the temple that was destroyed and the people of Israel were sent into captivity in Babylon. It's a true historical event. They're literally pulling Babylonian arrowheads out of bodies in the ground in Israel, even in the last 15 years that carbon date to this exact time, the exact experience, as a matter of fact, is what we're talking about. The temple was destroyed. The glory of the Lord picks up and leaves. It says there's a, an actual uh, wheels and mechanisms that lift it and it leaves Israel because of what they had done. Well, then there's a promise uh, about the valley of the dry bones. I've talked a little bit about this the last little while. I want you to just see two things in there. It's in Ezekiel chapter 37. This huge valley full of not just dead bodies. It's a huge valley full of bones. It's like an army that's fallen in a valley. This we would not necessarily uh, be aware, but back in those days, you would sometimes stumble across stuff like this in Bible days. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily be, have time to bury everything. You'd be out in the desert, especially in a wilderness. Uh, we think of wilderness like what's behind me, like a woods but in Israel, that's not the case. There aren't woods in the wilderness. It's desert. The Valley of the Dry Bones kind of is indicative in the title of this because the bones are so dried out, not because it's like a woods or a rainforest like where we live. It's because it's a desert. Those bones are lying on who knows how long they've been there. A long time. It's a huge army that has fallen in this Valley of the Dry Bones. Ezekiel 37, it says... Uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, the, something started to move. This Valley of the Dry Bones, uh, it says that uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit starts to happen and the bones start to rattle and make noise. They start to come up and they start to come together. As a matter of fact, it's like a whole giant valley that's full of these scattered both thousands upon thousands. As a matter of fact, it says an exceedingly great army. And now in those days, an exceedingly great army often could be like 100,000, 200,000, 130,000 soldiers. Those days or more, that's, what an ex that's a lot of dead bones and a lot of dead bodies. So 100,000 or more uh, worth, bodies worth of bones <laughs> starts rattling, coming together, and then they start to fit together. And it says... Uh, once this first outpouring or move happens, I've been talking about this a lot lately, and just hold on, I'll get this very important to get to. It says that all the bodies were put together, the sinews, everything came together, but the, there were then, it was then an army of lifeless bodies. Now this is like creepy. This enormous army of lifeless bodies lying on the valley floor. That's at the end of the first move in Ezekiel 37, that's what you're left with. Then it says this. Then it says, uh, God said to Ezekiel, now Ezekiel, 
prophesied to the four corners, uh, and it says wind or ruah in the Hebrew. Now, I know this because I studied this for years. Ruah, as a matter of fact, if you actually say it in Hebrew, you wouldn't know this about Hebrew. Hebrew often plays out the way the action plays out when your body pronounces it. Ruah. You have to actually say the word. Now, you're going to make fun of me. In Hebrew, you actually... It's like a Scottish H. You pull that H out in Hebrew. Ruach is exactly how you say it. You have to breathe out to pronounce the vocabulary. Literally in Hebrew. That is the way it's made. Don't make fun of me on this one. This is actually true. Ruach. Ruach. You have to breathe it out when you say it. Why am I saying this? Because it says, he had, it said, breathe that wind or spirit. Wind and spirit is the same word in Hebrew. There's no difference between wind and spirit. It's the exact same word. It's one word. And it's ruach. You speak out with your breath when you say the word. And it says it that way for a reason. The breath of people, the wind or the breath of people, as you breathe out, it's like wind in the air. That's what they were communicating in the language. And it says, that, it says Ezekiel, prophesy to the wind, Ruah, to go into the bodies of the army. Ezekiel had to say this out. He didn't. The wind, the spirit, was the spirit of God that moved. It's actually the only place in the Bible where anyone commands, so to speak, prophesying the spirit of God to do anything. It's kind of crazy. Now, he obviously was told by God to prophesy to the Ruah to pour out from the four corners, and then it went into the bodies. You and I, you're like, why are you talking about this so much? Well, I need to paint a picture for you. It's very, the vocabulary literally paints it. The way you say the word, ruach, you have to breathe out to say it. It flushes it out. The wind of the spirit went into the bodies based on Elijah prophesying in obedience to the command from God. Why does this matter? When God moves in an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you work with God in that way. You don't ever command God what to do. Sometimes God tells you to say something that comes from him like a prophecy that then his power moves behind. It's not your words per se, but you have to cooperate by even speaking at times what he wants you to say. Elijah and those guys, Ezekiel, they often would have to do, God called Elijah to do something. Elijah had to commission Elisha to continue the work that he couldn't finish. When he passed on the mantle, when Elijah went up to heaven in the uh, chariot, Elijah picked up his mantle, it says, which was like a cloak. It's almost like I don't mean to be ridiculous, but if you've ever seen the Jedi, Return of the Jedi's, the Jedi's wear those. In some ways, it's similar. It's, a, it's like an epoch. You pull it over your head. It's like a cloak. And that's that fell on the ground, and he picked it up. He carried on a continuance of the call of Elijah went to Elisha to do the task. He couldn't finish it. The other guy finished it. Now, why am I saying this? There's times where ministries are carried on, but there's times, and I don't want to look at that. I'm not talking about ministries that carry on. I'm talking about working with God. That's very different. Ezekiel worked with God. He didn't work for God here. No, he did kind of work for God, but the, we think of it, and you need to really pick this up. I don't want to focus on you and your life working for God, I want you to focus on working with God. There's times, most times in the Bible, you don't see people working for God. You see people working with God. So God, in each individual instance, in this instance, in Ezekiel 37, an entire army of lifeless bodies was filled with the Spirit, rose up, and it was a, a mighty army. Why is this important to see? Ezekiel did almost nothing compared to what God did. But he did do something. He obeyed what God told him to speak. 
he said, he prophesied to the, to the wind to come and fill these bodies. We just want to get a picture of how, don't work for God, work with God. You and God, God wants to have a relationship with you. And in your capacity to do anything, it'll be minuscule. You won't be able to do anything. But when you work with God, God does, God picks the fight. God picks what you're going to do. God is the instigator of everything. It's not like you came up with the idea. No one on earth would have come up with an idea of having a valley of dry bones coming to life, fit together, and then you prophesy and the wind comes in and they stand up. That picture has two distinct outpourings. It's very important to say there's the latter rain and the former rain in Israel. Israel actually is a very distinct climate. In Israel, you have an initial rain that to this day still happens. The initial rain gets the ground ready to plant the harvest. They plant the harvest. The latter rain helps bring the harvest in. There's always two rains, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the Bible is often connected to that rain geographically to how it falls in the Bible, in the land in particular, which is Israel. It talks about this in the Old Testament, talks about it in the New Testament. All I want you to know is, again, the rain falls so that they can bring in the harvest. God's in charge of the rain. God's in charge of most of it. We just work with him. And God wants you not to work for him, but work with him. When you have the Holy Spirit having a plan, he will want you to work with him to do what no one can do but him. I just want to say that again. When you work with him, you, you end up doing for him the things that no one can actually do. Only he can do it. But he lifts you up to bring you into the plans and the purposes that he has. Remember, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, heard no mind has conceived what God has in store for those that love him. In your life, I believe that can be true. God wants to fit you into a purpose of working with him. Some people say, what's my purpose in life? God, give me, a, give me a vision. Give me a commission. God, show me what to do. I want to work for you. What God says is, don't focus on what it is he wants you to do. Focus on working with him. It's the relationship. If you want to carry out a ministry for the Lord, the first hurdle to understand is that your mind won't know how God works. If you've ever gotten hired at a new organization or for a new boss, you will notice certain organizations or bosses have different ways of working. You have to get to know the person to know how it works. In the Bible, you don't work for God. You work with him. And if you look at the Bible, that's what you can see. It's very critical to catch that. Don't look for something to do for God. Look to God so you can work with him. This may sound like an odd thing. I'm going to close with this thought. It is very odd. If you're, say, a leader in a church or you're a helper or a volunteer, many times people say, I want to do this mini ministry. There's these many things that I could do, but I want to do this. And the reason I want to do this is I get something out of it. I get, I get something out of this. Now, this sounds terrible to say, but at some point, if that's your attitude, usually you'll be tested. If, you, if the reason you do things is getting something out of it for you, that's not going, it may be good enough for you, but, but biblically, it's usually going to be tested by God. God does, it's the wrong attitude. What you do isn't for you usually. Now, a lot of people think that's the case. Matter of fact, many people I've talked to, that's what they want. What I find is those people are usually not submitted the way God wants them to be, and you will be tested on that. You don't do things for you. You don't do things for my satisfaction. You do things with him. And at some point, he may take something from you to test your motive. If your motive is to do something that fills you, I like doing this, I need to do it. 
that is usually not going to pass long term a test that you're going to remain standing in the evil day based on that one. You want to do things because you're working with him. He's the reason you do it. You do whatever he wants me and you to do. It may not always feel good and God is still for you when it doesn't. And if somebody takes the thing away or something takes the thing away, you should be, you will be, as a matter of fact, tested on that point. Biblically, you don't serve for what you get. A servant does what his master wants and at the end of the day says, well done and thou good and faithful servant, enter into your word. Not because they did something they wanted. If you're doing something you want, I hate to tell you this, if you're doing something that you want because it makes it's it's what you want to do, it probably at some point will be taken from you to see what your motive is. That's a horrid thing to say. That's often when we say we're working for God, that's the limits of working for God. When you're working with God, it's the relationship that's, that's it's a very subtle thing. That's the definer, that's the difference. And that phrase, in those two different phrases, it's very interesting that you can find that God will fulfill you with the second phrase. The second phrase is how you get going in the ministry. The second phrase is how you get going to find value to life. To find value to life, don't just find something you can do for God that makes you feel good. Work with God and in his capacity, you can do anything that he wants you to do. Please hear me. When you work with God, you will find his capacity is there to fight for you. You just insert in the things. Be obedient to what he's telling you to do. Working for God, I want to do this, doesn't mean you're being obedient to what he's telling you to do. That's the key to everything I'm saying. You can work with God and you have to be obedient because the relationship sustains you. My obedience to what he's saying is seen by him in working with him. If I just say I'm working for him, I want to do something for him, I pick what he wants? No, I just pick kind of something I think he might like. And then I kind of get fulfilled. Usually that you won't be able to handle long term what comes. I want you to know God wants you to work with him. His relationship is embedded in that statement in the Bible. That's how it works. Maybe just look at it and say, God, I want to work with you. I want to have a relationship that would be of the nature of the kind that I could work with you. I work, I know him. Abraham was picked by God, the Bible says, because God said, I have a task for this, For I have a task. I want someone to communicate to the children. I want them to have, him to have the knowledge of God on his lips and communicate it to bless the generations. God said, and that guy Abraham will do it, the thing I want him to do because I know him. That's what it says. God picked him because he knew him and he knew that he would do it. I just want you to know God wants to know you. Don't get too caught up in doing things. Know him, work with him, and you'll survive. And at the end of the day, he'll say, good and done, thou faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen.